congregation, the text for the preaching this morning is uh, from the first, it's the first part of chapter 45. I won't read that again. The first is 1 to uh, 15. It is the, uh, the part of the story where we see the interaction with Joseph and his brothers. Uh, it begins with their total dismay and, and shock. And at the end, they talk with him and they see this, uh, this new unity. Let's see. So that's the, that's the text. In response to the preaching, we will sing from Psalm uh, 96, no, 96, verse 4 and 8. Song of response, Psalm 96, verse 4 and 8. Congregation of our Lord Jesus Christ, over a number of Sundays, uh, and, and Sundays pretty far apart sometimes, but over a number of Sundays we have read the story of Joseph's life, how he was sold to Egypt, how he became a, a servant, a slave of Potiphar, how he became the trusted general manager in Potiphar's household, how he ended up in prison when he refused to sleep with his master's wife, how he became second in command in the political hierarchy in Egypt. You may remember what happened when Joseph and his brothers met for the first time after many years of separation. They did not recognize Joseph in this grumpy and, and distrustful Egyptian governor, but he recognized them. All these things are, 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 are fascinating stories and fascinating moments. But we've also learned to place those events within the greater framework of what God is doing. How the Lord is working on his plan of salvation, even in the midst of all these unpredictable bends in the road. Step by step, God has been preparing Joseph for his task to save God's covenant people. That's what it was. They needed to be saved, not just from starvation. That was part of it. That's how God used it. But also, and more importantly, from, from gradual assimilation with the pagan culture, the immoral pagan culture in Canaan. And that that was a danger is illustrated by the story in Genesis 38. Well, then, by the grace of God, things are indeed changing. Last time we saw what happened when Joseph's brothers came to Egypt for the second time. Now, initially, everything went well. But then things took a nasty turn when, Joseph, when Joseph's silver cup appeared to be stolen and was found in Benjamin's sack. However, more and more, it has become clear how relationships have changed within Jacob's family. Judah's final plea at the end of chapter 44 is, is the moving evidence of repentance before the Lord, of, of, of reconciliation, of mutual love, of compassionate care for the youngest brother, and especially for their father. Remember Judah's final emotional words in chapter 44, verse 34. When Judah says to Joseph, not knowing he's talking to Joseph, how can I go back to my father if the boy is not with me? I fear to see the evil that would find my father. There must have been a deep silence in the room at that moment. And then the tension breaks and we witness the most dramatic moment in the whole Joseph narrative. But keep in mind, it is the Holy Spirit who brings about the victory of God's grace for God's purpose. God's grace reconciles Joseph and his brothers. That's the message this morning. 
God's grace reconciles Joseph and his brothers. Finally, they see each other, they see the plan of God, and they see a new future. So God's grace reconciles Joseph and his brothers. They see each other, they see God's plan, they see a new future. Congregation, Judas' emotional plea at the end of chapter 44 makes a deep impression. Right? The previous time we recognized in Judas' confession of guilt and actually his, 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 his willing to sacrifice himself, we recognized the power of the Holy Spirit. We recognized the Spirit of Jesus Christ. And now Joseph sees that. He sees that radical change in the attitude, in the mindset of his brothers. And how radical was it? Remember from the chapters 34, 37, and 38, how Jacob's family, God's Old Testament church, was divided by hatred and jealousy. How life in God's covenant was, was threatened because they felt more and more comfortable in the Canaanite culture and in the immoral lifestyle that came with it. But that's no longer the same. Finally, Joseph is, is fully convinced that his brothers are united in mutual love. They really care for their brother Benjamin. They show a deep compassion for their father Jacob. In Judah's urgent request, please let me remain here as my Lord's slave instead of the boy, but let the boy go back with his brothers. In that request, Judah Joseph hears what he was looking for. However, Judah's request will not get the response they were hoping for. After a tense moment of deep silence, things take a new turn, a totally surprising, absolutely astonishing turn, a turn that would every response to Judah make redundant. Now the moment has come for the complete and final reconciliation, the unraveling of what God has been working on for years during Joseph's years in Egypt. Now Joseph knows this is enough. You may remember that when he met his brothers before, Joseph had sometimes a hard time restraining himself and, and, and controlling his emotions. It happened a few times that he had to hurry out to another room because of his tears. His heart went out to them and to his father. Now it's time to let go. When he sees the victory of God's grace among the covenant family of Israel, he throws aside his Egyptian mask. He makes himself known as the long-lost brother Joseph. Now people have wondered why at this moment, this emotional moment, Joseph does not want to have strangers around. It's interesting. He says in verse 1, with a loud cry, that he ordered all the Egyptian servants to leave the room. Why was that? Now, some suggest that he might be ashamed of his tears. Others think that he was perhaps embarrassed that the Egyptians were going to find out that his, his ancestors were Hebrew shepherds. And, and other scholars assumed that it was considerate of the shame that his brothers might feel when their crime will become known to the Egyptians, people who have nothing to do with it. All these ideas are not very likely. I mean, his loud weeping could be heard all through the house, it says. And on top of that, immediately after this whole emotional event, Joseph shares the whole story with Pharaoh and his officials. That starts in verse 16. Now, it has nothing to do with shame, nothing to do with embarrassment. Joseph is not ashamed of his tears. He's not ashamed of his emotions, not at all. And that's good. Think of that for a minute, because that's also good for us. Are we not too often inclined to restrain our emotions? Or, and that's worse, to deny our emotions? 
Are we not too often embarrassed to show our emotions, especially in matters of faith, in our relationship with God, with Jesus? No, 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 faith is not simply feeling. No? You have to watch out for that. That's not the case. Faith is more than a feeling. You can, you, you can talk about spiritual emotionalism. That's a faith life that is entirely driven by what you feel. No, that's not very healthy. That's not biblical either. At the same time, there is something amiss in our lives if the marvelous miracles of the love of God and the grace in Jesus do not touch your feelings. Of course they do. If these would not affect your emotional life. And it's okay to show that. It's okay to share that. Nowhere does the Bible teach us that impassiveness is a valuable Christian value. It's not. So back to Joseph. We can understand that this is such an intimate, such a deeply emotional moment between him and his brothers that it is simply no one else's business to witness that. And so, deeply moved and filled with overflowing love, Joseph has this emotional outburst. And as he is weeping, his perplexed brothers hear the most bewildering words they could have ever thought of. I am Joseph. Is my, brother, is my father still alive? Now don't say, well, they told him already about his father, so what's the point of asking? That's true, of course, but that's, that, that's not the point. It's not a rational request for information, but it is the emotional cry of a son who has missed his father's love for so many years. It is the scream of a deep longing that had filled Joseph's heart since the day he was sold. You can imagine that his men are standing there. Thunder struck, stunned, absolutely dumbfounded. What in the world is going on all of a sudden? They were at a loss for a word. It says, it says in, the, in, in, in our Bible that they were dismayed. They are baffled. But it's not only that. The word also has an element of fear. And that's why the NIV translates that they were terrified. And you cannot really blame them. Whatever they may have expected, in their wildest dreams, nothing like this. All they see is this Egyptian governor who is totally upset, who is weeping uncontrollably, and who claims to be their own brother. We don't know what went through their minds. It must have been a, felt like a, like a weird dream. It's frightening. The first thing that hits home, and that's where, where, where the fear is coming from, the first thing that hits home is the seriousness of the deep guilt towards their brother. I mean, if, if this is true, if this man is indeed Joseph, there is more to come. They realize what they deserve. And now they, they, they may fear Joseph's wrath. He has all the power. He can do with him whatever he feels like. Joseph understands that. He understands all that. And, and so Joseph is trying to put him at ease. Come near to me, he says. Please, please. Well, they do so hesitantly, still confused and shocked. And then he tries again. Listen, he says, I am your brother Joseph. I am the one you sold to Egypt, remember? Look, it's me. Really, believe me. And to prove his claim, he reminds them of what has happened some 22 years ago in Dothan. You may wonder why he needed to do that. Is he, is he rubbing it in to make them feel bad about themselves? No. But at this moment, it was necessary to point openly at, at this old guilt. Because that would allow them to point out at the same time that there is forgiveness. It has been forgiven. 
It is gone. So, so yes, it had to be mentioned. Well, they still don't know what to say. See, so Joseph does it for them. His heart is full of joy because of the changes that he has seen. That's why he adds in verse 5, Do not be distressed. Do not be angry with yourselves because you sold me here. They should no longer fear the consequences of what they have done. They don't have to. It's all over now. Joseph and his brothers may look at each other. They may recognize each other. They may see each other as the evidence of the grace of God and the forgiveness of God. And Joseph wants them to see that. He wants them to recognize what, or better, who is behind all this. He wants them to focus on what God has done. He wants them to see God's plans. He wants them to recognize God's intentions with sending Joseph to Egypt. That's the way to find God's grace. That's the way to see God's loving care for all his people. For a long time, that was not clear for Joseph himself either. But now he knows. Indeed, this, uh, this reconciliation between Joseph and his brothers, it is quite amazing. It's a moving, a touching moment when they see each other, they recognize each other, and they trust each other after so many years. But there's more to it. Together, they must come to see God's actions. And they must come to recognize and acknowledge God's plan in all these events. Behind the things they have experienced over the past year, Joseph himself and his brothers Behind that is the Lord's intention to save their lives for the progress of his work, his promised salvation in Jesus Christ. The same God who restores the harmony in Jacob's family is also going to maintain and protect the life of his people in Egypt. Joseph stresses that three times in these verses, verse 5, verse 7, and 8. God has sent me to Egypt before you. You did not send me here. God did. After everything that has happened to me, says Joseph, he has now given me the responsibility to limit the effects of the famine in Egypt. But behind this is the intention. It's God's intention, God's plan, that is, to maintain and protect you, your lives. In other words, by selling me to Egypt, you have actually been helping God to work out his plan. You didn't know it, and it was not your intention. As he continues to describe the situation, Joseph keeps pointing at that. For two years already, there has been famine in the land. It's not over yet. The future looks even worse. There are five more years of hunger to come. There will be neither plowing nor harvesting. No one will even bother going into the fields. Without Joseph, the situation would be hopeless. You have already experienced how bad things are. Without his help, his brothers and their families would for sure die from starvation. Well, he says again, precisely for that reason the God the Lord our God has sent me to Egypt. It's been a long way. I've been lots of trouble, lots of difficulties, moments of despair, but also signs of God's faithfulness. He has given me the top job in Egypt as special governor to control the food supply in this country. And by doing so, he has tasked me to prepare everything for your arrival. He keeps hammering on that. In his faithfulness, he made sure that everything would be in place for you to be looked after. Why is that? What is, what is, what, what is God's plan here, actually? In verse 7, two things are mentioned. First, says Joseph, to preserve for you a remnant 
on earth to make sure that your existence, your life, will continue in this world. And I think of that for a minute, then, then you realize how wonderful the faithful care of the Lord is. For we're talking about God's people. And in His grace, He will not let them disappear. He never will. That's God's promise. We're talking about the future of God's covenant of grace, and that continues until today. And it will continue till the end of our history. In, in, in this astonishing way, God shows us here that His covenant for us and our children is an eternal covenant. And, and that, that His faithfulness is everlasting faithfulness. And that the future of his covenant is in his hand all the time, regardless of what happens. He is going to safeguard his people in Egypt. Why? Because of his promise to Abraham, all peoples on earth will be blessed through you. And see, brothers and sisters, therefore, from age to age, God continues to pave the way for the coming of Jesus. And from then on, he will continue to pave the way till the very end of our history when he will gather his people from all tribes and all nations in the new Jerusalem. That's you and me today. And then you'll also recognize the other purpose that is mentioned in verse 7. To save your lives by a great deliverance. Through Joseph, God will provide Israel's livelihood, food on the table, but the point is again that this work will continue in this world. The work of His grace and the work of salvation. That's why He calls it a great deliverance. Well, think of that expression. It's a promise for, of, of freedom with a great and marvelous perspective. As the Lord protects His people against spiritual ruin in Canaan, he is already paving the way for showing his faithfulness in the exodus from Egypt about 400 years later to bring them back to the land promised to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. God is on his way to the greatest deliverance in the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ, the Savior of the world. Do you, do you recognize the amazing faithfulness of our God? He keeps his word. He maintains his promise on the matter what happens. Think of that. Think of that. He puts Joseph in charge of Egypt. He brings his brothers to him. He fulfills Joseph's dreams. He moves Judah to offer himself as a sacrifice. He reconciles the family. And all that for your and my future, the future of his covenant, the future of the gospel. My brother, my sister, this is not only Joseph's God. This is our God. Also today, the God of all grace, the God of the greatest deliverance ever. We watch the news. We listen to our political leaders. We see what's going on in our culture. We see what's going on in the world. And, and we don't always understand what's going on. Neither did Joseph most of the time. But all these things can get pretty discouraging. But when we only go by our human observations of by what the media are telling us, we miss what is going on, what is really going on. We need the lens of God's Word to see that the Holy God is working out His plan. Again, we don't always understand it, and neither did Joseph, but that's what God is doing. By saying, God made me a father to Pharaoh, Joseph emphasizes again that, that, that God made him a wise and trusted advisor to the king of Egypt. Not to brag about it, but to show again God's unique care for His people and for His work. By the way, uh, the question could come up. Uh, would Joseph's conclusion, when he says that, you did not send me here, but God did, would that be a valid excuse for his brothers? 
Could it, could it justify their sin? I mean, if I do something wrong, but it turns out to be part of God's good plan, I'm off the hook, right? Is it still wrong? Do evil things become good things? The answer is no. Joseph's brothers are not excused just because in the end everything turned out all right. But it does confront us with this much debated question, of course. Uh, we believe that God is fully in control. And, and you and I at the same time are still 100% responsible for what we are doing. How does that work? And there's no doubt by all kinds of scenarios in life, you, you have discussed that question and thought about that question. If God is in control, everything, how can we be responsible for everything that we do? Well, without going into too much depth about that, somehow the holy and almighty God makes use of the evil plans and activities of sinful people, of godless people, of people who don't care about his will. In his sovereign power, God uses all these things to work out his counsel, to work out his plan. No matter how sinful, no matter how malicious people's plans can be, how destructive people can act, our God has his own intentions. And he will make sure that in the end, the outcome will reflect not necessarily your or my intentions, but his intentions. However, that does not provide an excuse for human evil. It does not imply that you and I and everybody else are not accountable for the bad things we say and do. It doesn't take away our guilt. It doesn't take away our sin. Our problem is that, that most of the time, if you are at the receiving end of evil experiences, you don't know why these things happen to you and, 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 and how that could possibly be good for you. But hold fast, hold fast, trust all the time that nothing happens beyond the will of God. Regardless of what people have in mind, regardless of the plans and that people have, the God of heaven and earth controls our plans and efforts for the sake of his own plans, according to his own intentions. And those plans are good. Oh, it's true. It's true. God often works in most mysterious ways, ways that can often leave us perplexed. Right? But keep in mind, God is not accountable towards you and me. His way in the history of the world, his way in the history of the church, his way in your and my life is much too deep for us to fathom. God controls even the sinful plans and the wrongs we are responsible for. Whatever. At the same time, everything he does is free from sin. When Joseph's brothers sold him to Egypt, their purpose was to make Joseph disappear. And at that time, it looked like God was doing the same. He made Joseph disappear. But God's intentions were totally different. His goal was to safeguard his people. Of course, Initially, Joseph himself did not have a clue either why he had to go through all of that. Sometimes we wonder where God is. Where is God going with us? Where is God going with this world? What does is, what is love and compassion for us look like? He's supposed to be your loving father, right? And there are times that he seems to do the very same things that, that, that our godless enemies are going for. And someone can even say that to you at some point in time in your life. Look what you're dealing with. Look what the trouble you are having. What's your God doing for you? My brother, my sister, trust your father's good intentions. Let it, be, let it be the source of hope and comfort 
and encouragement in your daily struggles. And then you will also learn to forgive, to be gracious. Look at Joseph. The crime that was committed more than 20 years ago, it could have filled him with anger and desire for revenge. Now we had the opportunity. But Joseph sees their hatred conquered by the grace of God. His great mercy in Jesus Christ covers the sins of those who repent, confess their guilt, and humble themselves. And so Joseph forgives them. Together they may see the plan of God. Together they may now recognize God's grace when he opens a new future. And this is the message that has to go back to Jacob in Canaan. As soon as possible. Hurry up, says Joseph. Hurry back to my father. Tell him everything. Verse 9 and verse 13. Tell him that I'm alive. Tell him that I'm a powerful man in Egypt. And urge him to come down to me. With the whole family. Everyone. Let them take along everything they have. For it's not going to be a short visit. Five more years of famine are still to come. In his mind, Joseph has already picked an area in Egypt where they could live, the region of Goshen. Later on, that's confirmed by Pharaoh. And we don't know exact the location of Goshen, but it was somewhere between the desert and the east side of the Nile Delta. It's probably also fairly close to Joseph's own residence. That would make sense, right? In, in what Joseph is saying in the verses 9 to 13, uh, uh, you can sense his deep desire, his impatient longing to see his father again, and also his urge to fulfill the task that the Lord had given him, to provide food and security for God's people. That's, that's fantastic. But let's not lose sight of the fact that this is actually a pretty drastic move for the covenant family. Family of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. During this famine, settling in Egypt was God's way of taking care of them. And of course, Jacob wanted to see his long-lost son again. Think of the last verse in this chapter. But the flip side is, they had to leave the land that God had promised to give them as a possession. Where is that going? See, see, that's why the Lord reassures Jacob, this is in chapter 46, when he is about to cross the border, that his covenant promises will not change. He says to Jacob, do not be afraid to go down to Egypt. I will go down to Egypt with you, says God. And I will bring you back again. For now, Egypt will provide the food and the safety you need at that time. But the grace of God in those temporary circumstances, you will grow into a great nation, says God. And in those 400 years, God himself will prepare them for the time to return and by the same grace take possession of the promised land. That goes all the way, the rest of the four books, of the first books in the New Testament, up until Joshua. Sure, Joseph is, is taking care of arranging the logistical details here. But it is God's great faithfulness that guarantees the future of his people. He is using, God is using, and he will always use the political and economic powers of the world to fulfill his promises, to complete his plan in the saving work of Jesus. Isn't it amazing? Isn't it amazing to see throughout this whole story how God works in everything for the benefit of his people? All of Israel, all his children. That's what God had in mind all along. Our God always works out his plans through all the human plans and efforts. In Canaan, in Egypt, in Canada, in Russia, in Ukraine, everywhere. God continues to work. And then, the last verse of our text, 
the joy breaks through, finally. Initially, they were too stunned to say anything. And then when it sank in that this was indeed their brother Joseph, they were not so sure where this was going to go. It's a stark reminder of their guilt. But then when they realized that Joseph will not take revenge, slowly the fear and the bewilderment disappear. After all this, since at the very end, for 15, his brothers talked with him, it says. Yeah, the, then the joy is complete. The wonderful joy when they share a new harmony and see the prospect of a new future. What a miracle. No more fear, no more distrust, unity restored, final reconciliation is effects. Verse 14 and 15, brothers and sisters, is a moving picture of this emotional reunion. Many tears were shed. They must have done a lot of talking. There was so much to ask, so much to tell, so much to explain. And here is what is most wonderful and most special in all of this. We see the visible victory of the grace of God. We see the renewing power of God's grace who brings people together. And, and, and this victorious power of God's grace in Jesus Christ, it's the same today. In His grace, God Almighty brings people together in submission to His Word and in His Spirit. And, and He binds us together as His people. And regardless of what has happened in the past, regardless of what we have been struggling with, He will fill us, His grace will fill us with new hope. And He will put us on the road towards the new future. Brothers and sisters, this is our God. His action in Joseph's palace guarantees the progress of His grace among us today. The church of God may move forward in good courage, so be filled with hope, with strong hope on your way to the grand future of Jesus Christ. Amen.